Before we actually discuss voltage gated and ligand gated ion channels, let's focus on the structure of an ion channel. And to generalize the structure of an ion channel, we're going to focus on a specific type of ion channel known as the potassium ion channel. So the potassium ion channel allows the movement of potassium ions across the membrane down their electrochemical gradient from a high electrochemical potential to a low electrochemical potential. Now, the structure of potassium ion channels basically consists of four individual and identical polypeptide chains, and each one of these subunits, each one of these chains, looks like this. So we basically have these three domains, three alpha helices, one shown in brown, one shown in dark purple, one shown in light purple. Now, it's the dark and the light purple alpha helices that we call the membrane spanning alpha helices. And that's because these are the regions of the protein which are found within that hydrophobic core of the membrane. They essentially anchor, they attach that entire structure of the protein into that hydrophobic core of the membrane. And so four of these identical polypeptide chains come together to form a tetramer structure that looks like a cone. And that's because on one side of that cone, we have a larger opening than on the opposing side of that protein. Now we'll see why that's important in just a moment. The first question that I basically want to ask is the following. What exactly is it about this ion channel that gives it the property we call ion specificity? So ion specificity is the ability of the ion channel, in this case it's the potassium ion channel, to basically move specific ions, in this case it's the potassium ions, across the cell membrane, while at the same time preventing the movement of all other ions. So the question is, how is this property actually achieved by that potassium ion channel? And in general, how is it that these ion channels are so specific to the types of ions that they move across the cell membrane? Well, to answer this question, let's take a look at the following diagram. So the purple section is basically this tetramer potassium ion channel in a simpler form. And this is the internal cavity that the potassium ions will actually pass across. At the same time, that's the same cavity that will block all other ions from actually moving across. So this is our membrane, the outside the cell, the inside the cell, and these orange ions are the potassium ions. So notice we have a higher concentration on the inside than on the outside, and so these ions will move spontaneously in this direction. Now we also have a bunch of water molecules, and these water molecules basically describe that aqueous environment. So notice we have an aqueous environment on the outside and on the inside. On top of that, because this portion is wider than this portion of that protein, so because we have a larger opening, about 10 angstroms on the inside side than on the outside side where it's about 3 angstroms, so this internal cavity will have enough space to actually fit those same water molecules that exist on the inside cytoplasmic side of that cell. Now, why is that important? So about two thirds of the central cavity is filled with water and that makes an aqueous environment. But why is that important? Well, that's important because these K plus ions, the potassium ions, actually interact with the water molecules to form a more stable structure. And this interaction creates something known as the salvation cage or the salvation shell. So essentially, the full positive charge on these potassium ions interacts with the negatively or the partially negative charges on the oxygen atoms of the water molecules. And so the water molecules essentially orient themselves around the potassium to form a cage of water molecules we call the salvation cage. <coughs> And so this salvation cage creates an energetically more stable system and lower in energy because the formation of these bonds essentially releases energy and makes it more stable. And by the same reasoning, we see that if we break the bonds, that actually requires energy. 
And because two thirds of this internal cavity contains the water, when these potassium ions move into this aqueous environment, they do not lose those salvation cages. They do not break those stabilizing interactions and that's a good thing. So we see that about two thirds of the central cavity is filled with water because of that larger opening and larger amount of space on this side of that protein. Therefore, as the potassium ions into that cavity, into the inside, because of the presence of water, they do not lose that stabilizing salvation cage. But notice what happens in this particular region this region is very very small in fact it's so small and so restricted that the water molecules cannot actually fit into that region because it's only three angstroms wide and what that means is if the potassium ion actually wants to make its way into this section and eventually makes its way out of that cell to the other side it has to actually lose these water molecules. It has to lose that cage. It has to lose those stabilizing interactions between those water molecules. Now we know to lose these interactions, we have to input a certain amount of energy and that process requires energy. But we know this process does not require energy. So how is this actually fixed? How is this problem actually fixed? Well. It turns out that if we zoom in on this section, so let's suppose one of these potassium ions makes its way into this region and it loses these water molecules. So what exactly happens in uh, what, what exactly happens to that potassium ion as it travels through this section? Well, within this restricted region of the cavity, we basically have a five amino acid sequence known as a selectivity filter on each side of that potassium ion. So one on the left side and one on the right side. So we have the sequence of threonine, valine, glycine, tyrosine, and glycine on this side as well as on this side. And the reason we have these identical sequences is because we have four of these identical polypeptide chains that create this tetrameric structure. And so what happens is the one of the functions of the selectivity filter, this sequence of five amino acids, is that they're oriented in such a way so that the carbonyl oxygen atoms, these atoms shown in red of these residues, these amino acids, basically orient themselves in such a way as to form stabilizing interactions between the partially negative charges of the oxygen and the full positive charges on those potassium ions. So these interactions shown in green and those interactions are overall more stabilizing than interactions between the water and the potassium. So even though we have to input a certain amount of energy for this potassium to actually move into this restricted area and break that salvation cage, we form more stabilizing bonds and when these bonds are formed, energy is released and the amount of energy that is released in this process is greater than the amount of energy that is used to actually break these bonds. And so the sum of those two values will give us a negative free energy. And what that means is this process of the movement of these uh, potassium ions across is an overall spontaneous process. It will take place spontaneously because free energy is released into the environment. Now, the second function of the selectivity filter, this sequence of five amino acids within this restricted area, is to basically give that specific channel its ion specificity. So, we see that the selectivity filter also determines the specific nature of that ion channel, its ability to actually move these potassium ions across that membrane. The question is why? Well, let's begin with the easy case. Let's suppose that we take an ion that has a greater radius than the potassium. Well, if the ion has a greater radius than the potassium, the reason that ion cannot pass across is simply because it's too large. Its diameter is too large and it cannot actually move across this 
3 angstrom width. Now, what happens if the ion is smaller than potassium? That's the slightly more difficult a question to actually answer. So, for instance, let's, let's compare sodium and potassium. Now, potassium, the ionic radius of potassium is, ab is about 1.33 angstroms, while the ionic radius of sodium is about 0.95. And so we see that the ionic radius of these potassium ions is about 40% greater than the ionic radius of our sodium ions. So let's suppose this one is sodium. So if these sodium ions are so much smaller, the question is, why cannot that sodium ion actually pass across that membrane? How is it that the potassium ion channel actually blocks the movement of this smaller sodium ion? Well, the answer lies in this salvation cage. So we saw that in the case for potassium, when potassium loses this salvation cage, that requires an input of energy, but because of the size of the potassium, because of it being just the perfect radius, just the perfect size, it can form these uh, intermolecular interactions, which are overall more stable than these intermolecular interactions. And so the sum of those two values produces a negative free energy, and this reaction takes place spontaneously. Now, in the case of the sodium ions, this is what we basically see. The sodium ions form these stabilizing interactions with the water molecules. And so this is our sodium atom. These are the interactions. These are the water molecules. Now, when the sodium ion moves into this region, what happens is because its radius is so much smaller, then the radius of this potassium, these distances are so much greater, these interactions will be much weaker. In fact, these interactions that are formed are not as stable as the interactions that we have here. And so what that means is, on this side, to break this, we have to input a certain amount of energy, but when this is formed, we release a certain amount of energy, but the amount of energy that we release is less than the amount of energy that we need to break these bonds between the water and that sodium. And so ultimately we see that because of the small size of the sodium ions, they cannot form stabilizing interactions with the amino acids of that selectivity filter. And what that means is that reaction, the movement of the sodium ion through the potassium ion channel will not be favorable because it will actually require an input of energy. And so the process by which sodium moves across this potassium ion channel will not take place spontaneously because it will not release a certain amount of free energy. So we see that only the potassium ions can actually move across the potassium ion channel because only the potassium has the proper size, has the proper ionic radius that basically ensures that these interactions formed within this region of that cavity are more stable than interactions between the potassium ions and the water molecules within this salvation cage.